If you have a Bible, do have it open at Acts and chapter 5. Uh, that was on page 970 uh, in the Church Bibles. Acts and chapter 5. So Acts, uh, we've been in for a few weeks now. Uh, just a reminder, uh, in case uh, you need one, that uh, Acts is the story of the early days, the early years of the New Testament church, uh, a church that we are a part of today as well, here in Ingleton. Uh, God's New Testament uh, people, made up of people from all over the world, Jew and Gentile, that's just non-Jew, uh, alike. And it's, it's an exciting story, isn't it? Of all the books in the Bible, perhaps the most exciting narrative, if you like, in many ways, is the book of Acts. Uh, you're free to disagree, of course. Uh, but I, I love the story of the book of Acts. It is so uh, thrilling to read of what God does uh, as the church expands from these small beginnings on the day of Pentecost. Within the, well, By the end of the day of Pentecost, it's not so small anymore. It's already growing. And then it continues to grow and grow and spread and spread uh, from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria and then to the ends uh, of the earth. Uh, and we're still living in those days now. Uh, the church is still growing uh, and spreading. But as you read through Acts, uh, if you do read through it, the early chapters, uh, at one point you might think, wait a minute, I've read this before. You might get a little sense of deja vu, especially when you reach chapter 5. Uh, in the previous chapters, Peter and John like to pray, Sorry, I always quote this in the words of the song rather than the Bible. They met a lame man on the way. He asked for arms and held out his palms. And this is what Peter did say. Silver and gold have I known him. And so on. The man gets up and walks and leaps. A miracle is done in the temple courts. And an opposition comes. The pattern goes a bit like this. There's uh, teaching about Jesus. Miracles. People being saved as they repent and put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ to save them from their sin. Then there's opposition. Then there's imprisonment. There's interrogation and threats. There's a command, be quiet. But then there's release. And there's continued teaching and proclaiming of the gospel and the church grows. Ah, that was actually before Acts 5. But then in Acts 5... It happens all over again. Teaching about Jesus, people being saved, miraculous hearings, opposition, imprisonment, threats, be quiet, release, continued witness and growth. Uh, maybe God is trying to, to teach the early church something. And us. We're going to look at chapter 5 under three main headings this morning as we work through it. The first one is simply this. God grows his church. God grows his church. Verses 12 to 18 and then uh, we'll have a little look at verses 34 to 40 as well under this heading. So verses 12 to 18, uh, Kath read them out earlier. It's a bit of a summary, that paragraph, of what was going on uh, in Jerusalem. There's signs and wonders being done among the people through the hands of the apostles. They're all together in Solomon's colonnade, that's in the temple in Jerusalem. Uh, no one else there to join them. Probably because they'd seen the opposition earlier with Peter and John uh, doing a miracle in the temple and being hauled up before the leaders. Uh, but despite that, people spoke well of them. Believers were added to the Lord in increasing numbers. Multitudes of both men and women. Uh, and then people would be brought to the apostles, especially Peter, uh, for healing uh, as well. There's a bit of a change. People are coming in from the town surrounding Jerusalem. There's that spread out from Jerusalem is beginning already. Uh, the church is growing. And maybe the church thought, well, we've, we've had one bout of opposition. It's not succeeded. Uh, it's all going to be plain sailing now. It's all going to be easy. It's all going to be great. And uh, then it's not. And it's not. Verse 17, And the high priest rose up, he and all who were with him, who belonged to the party of the Sadducees, were filled with jealousy. So they arrested the apostles and put them 
in public jail. There's opposition again. Opposition. Why? Why? Well, there can be all sorts of opposition reasons for opposition to the church, but, but Luke tells us exactly why these people opposed the New Testament church. He tells us exactly why at the end of verse 17, doesn't he? They were jealous. They were jealous. Uh, they wanted people to listen to them. They wanted people to follow them. They wanted to be the ones who were looked up to as the authorities, especially when it came to life and how you live it before God. They were jealous. They had not seen anything like the explosive growth in followers that these, well, largely uneducated Galileans were seeing. And they, they don't like it. I, I don't think that's really happening in the UK today, particularly. But something similar is happening in other parts of the world where you have a very um, government-heavy ideology that says this is the way you're to live, this is what you're to do, you're to follow us, we tell you what life is about. Think of communist China, think of Muslim Iran. There's a lot of opposition there, probably because there's a lot of jealousy. There will always be competing ideologies with the gospel. And jealousy will always arise when the church starts to do well and grows. Opposition will come. And the early church, we're learning now that many Christians around the world know that today. Maybe we will in the not so distant future. There's some very um, aggressive, I think, ideologies in our culture that say this is what you must believe about life and how it's lived. And if the church does grow, then we can expect the opposition to grow. Because there'll be jealousy. There'll be jealousy. Uh, so, verse 18, they're, they're thrown uh, into prison. But God doesn't stop growing his church. That's an encouragement, isn't it? Uh, that's an encouragement, I'm sure, to, to Christians in those countries where there is opposition. God is still growing his church in so many of them. We've mentioned some examples. It should be an encouragement to us as we perhaps think, is it going to get harder here? Is there going to be more opposition to the gospel? Is it going to become more obvious that we're opposed for what we say and do? God is still quite capable of growing his church and that's what matters ultimately. As we'll see right at the very end of this chapter. And that's what we should rejoice in. As we'll see right at the end of the chapter. God doesn't stop growing his church. Actually, one of the people on the council that the apostles were holed up before and imprisoned by got this. I don't know if this man ended up a believer or not. Maybe he did. Uh, there's speculation, I guess, on whether he did or not. But if you skip to verses 34 to 40, we didn't read these earlier, you have some very wise words from a man named Gamaliel. I'll just read them. Verse 34. But a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law who was respected by all the people, stood up in the Sanhedrin. Uh, so that's the, the council of religious leaders in Jerusalem. And ordered the men to be taken outside for a little while. That's the apostles who have been imprisoned. He said, just send them out of the room. I need to talk to you all. He said to the men of Israel, be careful about what you're to do, about to do to these men. Some time ago, Theodas rose up, claiming to be somebody, and a group of about 400 men ran into him. He was killed, like Jesus, and all his followers were dispersed and came to nothing. After this man, Judas the Galilean rose up in the days of the census and attracted a following. Now, that's not Judas, one of the apostles, by the way, that's a totally different Judas. Uh, he rose up, he also perished, and his followers were scattered. So in the present case, I tell you, stay away from these men and leave them alone. For if this plan or this work is of human origin, it will fail. I think Gamaliel had got something as well. Or maybe he didn't understand this in what he said, but movements that follow dead men 
not last. So if human origin, if it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You may even be found fighting against God. They were persuaded by him. Isn't that fascinating? And God can use all sorts of people to speak up for Christians <laughs> that you don't necessarily expect. Praise God when he does. But Gamaliel is absolutely right. He's right because, of course, Jesus is risen from the dead. He is still actively at work growing his church and the, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. It won't fall. It will continue to grow. We need our eyes open to that as Western Christians because our church is shrinking, generally, or apparently. But around the world, it's growing every day. The kingdom is growing from that tiny little mustard seed into that great big tree. That is what is happening because it's of God. So it will happen. It does happen. Interestingly, even here in this country, um, I was reading uh, some research papers done by a, a Christian the other day. This sounds like it's going to be very boring. I hope it's not. Uh, research papers. Um, a, a missionary uh, guy from, he's actually from South Craven Evangelical Church that we know where Paul Gaxton is the pastor. He's a uh, retired missionary called Eddie Arthur. He does a lot of research into this and he'd read a paper that was looking into the growth of the church in the UK. So is the church growing or is it shrinking? But he broke it down into different denominations and groups of church, churches. Um, not just any church that claims to be Christian. Uh, and what he found was that, yes, many churches are shrinking and will probably be gone within 30 or 40 years, definitely within most of our lifetimes. But they were the ones that no longer held to the gospel. They were the ones that were not proclaiming that Jesus is fully God and fully man, that he lived a perfect life, that he died on the cross, that he rose again, that he did that for our sins and that he is the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except by him. They are the ones saying that you have to come to Jesus to be forgiven and his spirit will come and live in you. Those ones aren't saying that. And they're dying. They're shrinking. They're disappearing. But he found a number of groups of churches that are growing. I think you know what they all had in common. Now they're not growing rapidly. It's not revival. That's not the claim. But they are growing. Maybe not every individual church in these groups, but the groups as a whole. FIEC is one of them. We're part of FIEC. And we're not the only growing group, but we're one. There are more people in FIEC churches now professing faith in Christ than there were 10 years ago, more than there were 20 years ago, and so on. It's growing. Again, not a big part of Baptist for us. There's other groups growing as well. And we'd love to see more growth. But be encouraged. God is still at work. His church is growing. Of course we should pray for more. We long to see more. Uh, secondly, we've seen that God grows his church. If it's a work of God, it will happen. And it does happen, as Gamaliel says. Secondly, though, God grows his church by preaching, teaching, word of mouth. It's as people speak that people are saved. Um, first of all, let's just think how the apostles might have felt in verse uh, 18. They get arrested and they get put in the public jail. Now, I don't know how they felt because we're not told. But I imagine they may have been a little perplexed. Don't you? This has happened once already. Um, Peter and John. And Peter said, well, basically the original he says, well, you make up your own minds. Do we obey you or do we obey God? We can't help but speak of what we've seen and heard. We're going to keep talking. And they were released. And I think it was me who'd think, oh, well, that's that sorted. <laughs> no more problems on that front. God has answered that. And then, I don't know how many days or weeks later it is, but they're back in prison for exactly the same reasons. That must have been a little discouraging, I would have thought. But the answer this time is just as affirmative that they are to keep doing what they were doing as it was last time. At verse 19, But an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail during the night and brought them 
out. Again, nothing's going to stop God from growing his church wherever and whenever he wants to. But it's what, they, what this angel of the Lord says to them that is, is so important. He said, verse 20, Go and stand in the temple. Go back to the very place where you got arrested twice. And tell the people about this life. Tell them. Tell them, tell them, tell them. <coughs> And there was lots of other stuff going on as well. We've read about it. There were miracles, signs and wonders being done. And no doubt God can do that again if he so wishes. But the main thing is that people hear the good news. God may decide to accompany that with miracles as well. But the main miracle that we want to see in anyone is that they are given life in Jesus. And if they don't hear the gospel, then they won't get that. They need to hear. So tell people about this life. That's, that's big stuff, isn't it? That's meaning of life stuff. And that's, that's what we were thinking about in the children's talk in some ways. Tell people that there's a God who made them, who gave them the life they have now. That he designed them, he made them. He originally made them like him, in his image. But things went wrong. First people rebelled against God, decided, actually, we don't want to follow your ways, God. We want to do it our way. A bit like me trying to put up the pool without looking at the manual. (laughs) We want to do it our way. And what happens? Everything goes wrong. Everything goes wrong for Adam and Eve. And when any of us do that in life, it goes wrong. It goes wrong in that we're we're cut off from God. We don't know what life really is, no matter how much we think we're doing a good job of running it ourselves. And we're living lives that won't last without Jesus. The angel of the Lord says to Peter and the others, go and tell people that your life is a mess, lost, actually headed for destruction without a change and tell them about Jesus the one who can change it tell them about the one who lived the life we could not live (coughs) perfectly faultlessly the one who loved to the very end and gave himself for us tell people Go and say it. Now, the way we approach that might be a little bit different to how Peter and the apostles did it in Jerusalem uh, as they spoke to the people there. After all, the people they were speaking to, and you see this in the early uh, chapters of Acts, they didn't need to be told about a God who had made them. They didn't need to be told about the fall. They didn't need to be told uh, about God's plan to one day send the Messiah who would be God himself. They didn't need to be told that. What they needed to be told is you killed him. Because they did. They needed to hear that. And that's time and again uh, in these early chapters of Acts uh, what the apostles declare. Uh, Peter's sermon and speech in uh, the day of Pentecost. He doesn't need to convince them that God exists. That God made everything. That God made everything good, but it went wrong because of people. He doesn't need to do all of that. He gets straight to Jesus, basically, and says, you crucified him, but God has raised him. You see a different approach later in Acts. Although, don't worry, it ends up being the same approach in the end. You see a different approach in Acts with Paul when he goes to Athens. So Athens is not Jerusalem. Athens is pagan. Now, Athens does not, at least the, the average Athenian, will not know much about the, the Jewish Bible. Some will, because there were philosophers who looked into all sorts of religions, but the average Athenian won't. Paul doesn't go straight to Jesus straight away. He talks more generally about God. He talks about the fact he's wandering through Athens, and he sees all sorts of altars everywhere. This is Acts 17. Most of them to gods like... Um, it's maybe the Roman names, but never mind, Zeus and 
Athena and so on. Uh, but he sees one to an unknown God. An unknown God. And Paul says, well, there's my in. There's my opportunity to speak to these people at a level that they're already at. There's a God they don't know. Let me tell you about the God you don't know. Let me tell you about him. And then he can talk about he made everything. In him we live and move and have our being. He quotes a, a Greek philosopher there, not the Bible, <laughs> to make that point. And eventually, having said, but we fell away from him. We've sinned against him. We've not kept his ways. He gets to Jesus. There's a man appointed who will one day return. You need to know him. You need to trust him. If you're going to be all right on that day when he comes back. God raised him from the dead. This unknown God, I declare to you, you can know through Jesus. It's a different approach, but it gets to the same place, doesn't it? If you want life, this life that they're talking about, told to talk about in verse 20, that's life with God, who may be completely unknown to people out there. They may not know anything about the Bible, but we can still tell them about him. We'll have to start a bit further back, but we need to get to Jesus. Because it's through Jesus uh, that we come to God and know life in him abundantly, as Jesus calls it. Lastly, We've seen that God grows his church. He will do that. Nothing will stop him doing that. God grows his church by word of mouth as people speak the good news about Jesus in ways appropriate to the people they're trying to reach at their level. And then lastly, um, even when it's hard, God will give us joy in doing that. Um, We're skipping past the the bit again with uh, Gamaliel in verses 33 uh, to uh, 39. But then you get to the very end and the conclusion of it all in verse 40. Let me read those words. After they called in the apostles, so Gamaliel has spoken to the council, they get the apostles back in and had them flogged. Just a mention of casual violence there towards them. (laughs) But there we go. It's not like they followed Gamaliel's advice totally. They still decide to flog them. They ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and release them. And you can often tell what a message is that people are proclaiming by what they're told not to say. Don't talk about Jesus. Okay? Then they went out, verse 41, from the presence of the Sanhedrin, licking their wings, holding their heads in their hands because I can't believe this has happened again. It's not fair. Rejoicing? Yes, rejoicing. They went out from the presence of the Sanhedrin rejoicing that they were counted worthy to be treated shamefully on behalf of the name. That's the name of Jesus. Isn't that amazing? I find that amazing. But that was their reaction. But the thing is, they, they, they knew they were so loved by Jesus. And they, they so loved him in return. <coughs> that they actually counted it an honour to follow in his steps. If we claim to be those who follow Jesus, well, we're not going to get upset when we do. <laughs> it's actually a cause for rejoicing. They can rejoice because they know where it's ended up for Jesus. It's ended up in glory. They're not some kind of masochists who enjoy being flogged. That's not what it is. But they know where this story ends. They've seen Jesus do it already. They've seen him uh, live this life. They've seen him be opposed and rejected by the religious leaders. They've seen him flogged and more than that, killed. But then they've seen him rise. They've seen him ascend to the right hand of the Father. And he's in glory forever. And they know, oh, well we're going the same way, aren't we? They rejoice that they were counted worthy to be treated as Jesus was. It's an honour, and they know they're going to the same place. Again, that doesn't mean we go looking for floggings. 
It doesn't mean that we rejoice when we hear of Christians in China or in Iran or in other areas, North Korea, um, Sub-Saharan Africa, being beaten and murdered for their faith. We don't rejoice in that. We, we lament. But we can rejoice in that we know where they've gone. We know where they've gone. And if it happens to us, we'll know where we're going to, won't we? They didn't see this as a a kind of sign that God had abandoned them. No, it was a sign that he was with them. That just totally turns on its head everything we might think, but, but that was it. Should we pray for faith like them? And for that sort of faith in people who are persecuted, they often say, pray that our faith won't fail. And we need to. Of course, it comes as no surprise, given all of that, what they go and do in verse 42. Every day in the temple, back to the centre of it all, and in various homes they continued what? Teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. They kept going. Isn't that an encouragement for us? We might kind of face different sort of discouragements. I don't think we're going to get flogged for doing this, but, but we might think, what's the point? Might we? We might think it's just not... It's just not producing anything. It is. Perhaps slowly. But it is. I think one thing that it's producing is when we do witness, when we do speak of Jesus, for ourselves, it it, it gives more joy, doesn't it? You think about what it's like when you, you speak to someone, you finally pluck up the courage if you're the sort of person who struggles to do so, like I am. You pluck up the courage to say to someone, oh, well, I follow Jesus. Let me tell you about, about him. And you do it, and afterwards, oh, wow, doesn't he give you joy? Maybe there's some exceptions to that, but generally he does. And don't underestimate what God is doing when you share the gospel, even if there isn't an instant conversion. Even if there isn't uh, an, even a, an admission that, oh, that's, that's good to know, I'll think about that. Maybe there's just opposition, rejection, mocking. You planted a seed. That's what we're called to do, isn't it? We're not called to convert people. We can't do that. We are called to share the gospel and then pray that God gives the increase. Paul writes about that later, doesn't he, in the New Testament. I planted the seed, Apollos watered, God gave the increase. We can rejoice as we do what God wants us to do. And what the apostles were doing, they weren't converting people. God was. We keep sowing the seed. We keep telling people about this life in Jesus. Shall we pray? Father God, we thank you again that you are growing your church. Thank you that every day you're adding multitudes of people to your kingdom that is growing we thank you for again for those places where it's growing rapidly Uh, God that is wonderful and we praise you for it we pray as well for our own country our own village as well and churches represented here by others too Lord again we we long to see growth in our churches Uh, thank you that there is slow but steady growth in churches proclaiming the gospel in this country Uh, Lord, help us to be encouraged by that, but help us to long for more as well. Help us to long for a a greater work of your spirit and pray for it. Uh, as As we seek to tell people about Jesus, give us the boldness that the apostles had to do that. To do it well, to do it wisely, to do it winsomely. Uh, to do it in ways that are appropriate to the people around us as we seek to bring them to the Lord Jesus Christ. We ask this for, for their good and for your glory. In Christ's name. Amen.